Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. We're grateful that you can gather with us today as we lift high the name of King Jesus. A couple of things, uh, housekeeping matters if you're here and visiting with us. Number one, always important to know where the restrooms are. They are through this door, right, right, right there. There's a restroom right there. And if you somehow find yourself outside during the service and get locked out, that front door is always open. You can always come in there. I have nursery for ages five and under down the hallway there for any who are interested. And if you have a visitor card, fill it out. And we've got these nice uh, wood offering boxes here at the entrance as well. You can drop that in there. And we just want to say thank you for visiting with us today. As we begin today for our scripture and prayer of invocation, we're going to have Hannah Rooks, who is our, one of our new interns this semester. So Hannah, would you come uh, read scripture and pray with us this morning? Good to see everyone this morning, a beautiful Sunday morning. Uh, first praise hymn this morning is All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name, page 202, and uh, let's sing verses 1, 2, and 3. Please stand if you're able. Father God, we come before you and we want to hail the name, the power of Jesus' name. God, we thank you that we get to come together as brothers and sisters and worship the greatness and power and might of our God. We love you, Lord. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, welcome again to worship this morning. A couple of announcements as we get started. First off, 
uh, you're invited to join us on Wednesday nights. We got um, uh, something for the whole family every Wednesday. Kids Connect starts at 6 p.m. Kids Connect and Youth. And again, you're dropping your kids off at the breezeway here and then picking them up in the basement. And uh, so 6 p.m. is Kids Connect and Youth. And then Christianity 101, 6, 15 p.m., we had an overflowing room on Wednesday night. It was fantastic. And so with uh, that, we didn't really have space for everybody, and we want to invite you, if you didn't come, to come with us. So we're going to try meeting in the fellowship hall this week. So um, just show up, and I'll tell you where to go. And so we'll be in a, in a bigger space this week for uh, Christianity 101. So I hope you can join us for that time as well. We're going to continue our conversation this week about what is the church uh, this Wednesday night at 6.15. Secondly, uh, Disciple Now, uh, we're partnering with some sister churches in our area for Disciple Now, February 23rd and 25th. Um, parents, talk to Zach. Zach, where are you? Stand up. Are you? Okay, yeah, you stand up. There you go. There's Zach. Thank you, Zach. Very, well done. Well done. Check that off your intern box this morning. Stood up in worship service. Um, Talk to Zach. Today is the last day to sign up and still get a t-shirt. You can sign up after today, but you won't get a t-shirt. And let's be honest, we, we're really doing this for the t-shirt, right? So um, today's the last day. Talk to Zach about that. Finally, uh, we're scheduling the second annual Cedar Rock Ladies Tea. It's in April. Uh, I don't have the date off the top of my head, so I won't tell you and mess it up. But uh, if you are interested in serving in any capacity, uh, after the worship service, if you would meet Millie, where are you with Millie? There you go. You don't have to stand up. Everyone saw your hand. That's just for the interns. Um, <laughs> interest meeting in the basement after worship. Meet down there, and she will give you kind of a lay of the land, and you can see how you can serve for that. Looking forward to that as well. Uh, as we transition to our time of prayer, one uh, thing we want to pray for in particular, we want to pray for the family of Miss Marlene Griffin. Miss Marlene was usually a valued member of the party corner right there, and uh, we miss her dearly. Uh, we miss her dearly. So please, let's pray for her family. Uh, visitation, I, I misspoke in the prayer message that I sent out this week. Visitation is tonight from 5 to 7 p.m. at Lancaster Funeral Home. And there will be a graveside service tomorrow at 1 p.m. at Lancaster Memorial Gardens. And then after the service, the church is going to provide a meal to the Griffin family. Uh, and so on your way to the ladies' tea meeting, if you would meet Miss Judy, Miss Judy, would you raise your hand? There she is. You're going to be down here, aren't you? You'll be down here. Come talk to Miss Judy and sign up for something to bring, whether you can come help or even if you can't come help, see if you can bring a side or something. I think she's got meat taken care of. But we want to bless this family and uh, shower love on them uh, as we, we, we dearly miss Miss Marlene. So let's pray for that family and, um, and for that. You know, Miss Mar I'm just going to go on a little side tangent here. Miss Marlene... Um, I told the family this. She's, you know, the oldest person I've ever baptized, and um, and I just thought it was beautiful <laughs> that she was. She came to me, and she's the one that wanted to to follow in believers' baptism. She felt like she wanted to recommit her life, and she was adamant about it. She said, "I have only one request. I typically do baptism at the start of the service." She said, "I need you to do it at the end of the service because I don't want to mess up my hair for the whole service." <laughs> so for Miss Marlene, we ch we change things. Um, so let's, let's pray for that family and for her dear friends as well. Uh, let's also be in prayer for Willis Gupton, uh, as he had some scans a couple weeks ago that indicate they need to try some new treatments. So let's continue to pray for him. Uh, let's continue to pray. And I've got a long list here. I'm not going to get to all of them, and I apologize in advance. But uh, Dustin Moore, with his ongoing health issues, we want to pray for him. Uh, thank you for praying for my, my mother-in-law, Vicki Matthews, Katie's mom. She texted me this morning. I'll read this to her. She said, tell everyone that I'm doing good thanks to all their prayers. I really appreciate all of their outpouring of love. Even though I'm far away, I feel a part of that church family too. I send my love to everyone. So, um, so thank you for praying for Miss Vicki. Uh, glad to have Miss Caroline Sharon back with us today. We've been praying for her. Uh, Dan Collette, continue to pray for him as he's recovering uh, from his uh, broken shoulder. And I heard, I heard Miss Martha uh, in, uh, in uh, the... First Sunday Fellowship this morning, that it might be a special day for y'all today. Yes. It might be 63rd anniversary. 63rd anniversary. <laughs> 63 years of putting up with Dan Collette. You get a gold star for that. Y'all forget about me. He has to put up with you. He has to put up with you. That's true. 
That's true. Well, we'll continue to pray for Dan as well. And then Jace. Jace Lester has got surgery February 12th. So we want to pray for our buddy Jace over there uh, and his parents as that's upcoming as well. I know there are other needs in the room, but let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. I'm going to pray aloud, and you pray in your own seat. Let's begin with a moment of silence. Father God, we come before you. In all of your might and your power, we confess, Lord, that we are inadequate in every way. We confess, Lord, that we are sinners who deserve your wrath and your judgment. And so we come bearing our sins, confessing our sins to you, Father. Asking you to forgive and to cleanse knowing that you will forgive and cleanse when we repent and bring them to you based on Christ's work on the cross. And we thank you for that work on the cross, Father. We thank you for the work of Christ, how he has made a way for we sinners to be forgiven and redeemed and brought into the family of God. And God, we're thankful for the family of God that we can bear one another's burdens. God, and when we lose one of our our own, our own family members, Miss Marlene, God, that we can grieve together as a family. And God, we pray for her family in a special way during this time, God, that you would strengthen them, bless them. And we pray, Lord, that you would use the sufferings of this moment, God, to help them to see the greatness of Jesus. Because we believe and know that Miss Marlene is not suffering any longer. She's with her Lord and Savior. And we thank you, God, that you offer that grace to each and every one of us. And God, we come today knowing there's hurts and pains and aches and fears and all kinds of things represented in a room like this. And brothers and sisters who can't be here this morning, but they wish they could be here, God, we pray that you would be a special comforter to each one. We pray, God, that you would draw near to yourself those who, who need comfort and peace and strength. And we, God, we pray that through it all, your name would be glorified. We love you, God. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our next praise hymn is Be Thou My Vision, page 60, and we will sing verses 1, 2, and 4. Please stand if you're able.
Amen. Thank you, choir. Thank you all for being here today as well. If you have a Bible, let me see your Bibles. Okay. If you don't, we have Burgundy Pew Bibles there for you as well. We're going to be in the book of Ephesians. That's right, the book of Ephesians, New Testament. Book of Ephesians. We're continuing our study of Paul's letter to the church here at Ephesus Letter to the Ephesians, we're going to be at the end of chapter 1, beginning with uh, verse 15, Ephesians 1, 15. Let me also remind you, if you're a 
kid or youth, we've got these uh, note guides here, or if you're an adult, you just want to have something to help kind of keep track of the sermon and stuff and, and, and ask good questions, this is helpful for that purpose. So parents, you can talk to your kids uh, on the way home about what, they, what we studied in God's Word today. Ephesians 1.15. We are turning there, Ephesians 1.15. When you're there, say, I'm there. All right. Let's stand in honor of God's Word if you are able. We want to read this whole passage together and ask the Lord to bless us and teach us and grow us as we study it today. Ephesians 1.15. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which He has called you, what are the riches of His glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of His power toward us who believe, according to the working of His great might that He worked in Christ, when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and a dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all and all. Let's pray. Father, magnify your name through this text today. God, as we weave through its intricacies, God, we pray that you would make clear to us what it is that Paul is praying. That we can learn from his example, Father, and also learn to experience and understand and see the same things he was praying that they would understand and see. God, we need your help. Be with us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. A little while ago, I mentioned uh, Wednesday nights. Uh, Wednesday nights, Christianity 101. We always begin that time with some time of extended prayer. That's one of my favorite times of the weeks for a lot of reasons. Uh, but one of the reasons I really enjoy it is because I get to hear other people pray. And I really enjoy hearing other people pray because, you know, we're all different. We've all got different personalities, and we all bring our personalities into uh, our lives when we, for example, when we pray. And everybody prays just a little bit differently. Some people pray with a spirit of deep reverence. Some people pray by quoting a lot of Scripture. Some people pray as if they were talking to their best friend. Think about uh, Miss Carrie Daniels. Miss Carrie, uh, it was like she was talking to Jesus right next to her, right? That's how she would pray. Just incredible. I like to learn from how other people pray. And also, you know, I've got different books of prayers. I've got a book of prayer for some dead Puritans. I like to read that. I have a, uh, a book of prayer from a pastor that I revere who passed away recently just other things like that. And, and I'm one of the weird people that enjoy this stuff. Because I enjoy seeing how other people pray because there's something about seeing that that helps me in my own prayer. We learn from each other and I am being chiseled and encouraged when I hear you all pray. When I read these dead people pray. And today, we get to kind of do the same thing. We get to be chiseled and encouraged and molded by reading a prayer from the Apostle Paul to the church at Ephesus. A prayer that, God, uh, that, that Paul prayed to the Lord about these beloved saints in Ephesus, and we get to read it and be shaped and challenged by it. So it's a, really a prayer in which he kind of does three things. He begins with a prayer of thanksgiving. Look again at verse 15. 
He says, for this reason, because I have heard of your faith, in the Lord Jesus, and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. Now, Paul knew the church at Ephesus really well. He was there kind of at its infancy. He saw the challenges they faced. He spent multiple years with them and raised up leaders and, uh, and was there for multiple years before he left. But even though at this point Paul had been gone for, for multiple years, he'd been gone for a while, he still gets reports about the Ephesian believers there in that church. And he hears that they are growing in their faith in Christ. He hears that they are growing in their love for all the saints. And by saints, we mean other brothers and sisters in Christ there in the congregation. And he hears this good news of what's happening there at the church at Ephesus. And what does he do in response? He says, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. Paul, in other words, is regularly praying for the church at Ephesus. And in particular, he regularly gives thanks to God for what God is doing in that church. Now, this is not the only time that Paul talks about praying for the church. In fact, his letters all throughout the New Testament are peppered with examples of him praying for different churches all throughout the region. And they're especially peppered with prayers of thanksgiving that Paul gives for these churches. For example, in Romans, Romans chapter 1, he thanks my God through Jesus Christ for the church at Rome. In Philippians, he thanks my God in all remembrance of you. In Colossians, he thanks God for the church at Colossae. In both letters to the Thessalonians, he gives thanks constantly, he says, mentioning you in our prayers. First Timothy, he gives thanks to his protege, Timothy, and Philemon, he gives thanks for his friend Philemon, and in 1 Corinthians, he even gives thanks for the church at Corinth. Now, some of you are thinking, what's the big deal? But if you've ever read Corinthians, you know that was a messed up church, right? <laughs> they had some situations. Uh, if you read that letter, you're like, man, what were they thinking, right? There's a lot of things to make you cringe when you read the letter to the Corinth, church at Corinth and all the things that he's having to critique them for. But even in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4, he says this, I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus. He even thanks God for the nasty old Corinthians, right? And this is just the examples of the prayers of thanksgiving. Clearly, Paul thought praying for the church mattered. Prioritized prayer for the church, and in particular, prayers of thanksgiving. I think we can learn from the Apostle Paul in this area. It is good to pray for your church. It's particularly good to give thanks to God for what he is doing in your church. And don't we have a lot to be thankful for? We too can thank God that he has given us the gospel of Jesus Christ, which transforms our lives. I mean, just think about what are the odds that any of us would have ever been in a room together outside of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Zero to none, right? We would have never been together. We too can give thanks that he is growing us in love for each other. I love First Sunday Fellowship because we're, get, we're around tables eating food and different combinations of people getting to know each other, love each other. We too can thank God for all the little miracles that we see happening around us. God's brought new faces, new families who jumped right in and started pulling the plow with us. How God has grown and challenged us. How on Sunday mornings and now on Wednesday nights, we use just about every single usable room in the education wing for educating somebody in the gospel of Jesus Christ. How at Christmas time, you gave a record Lottie Moon offering. How at Christmas time, you blessed three families with toys, food, a new bed even, the ability most of all to hear the good news of Jesus. We can thank God for how we dropped two new interns in our lap. I wasn't looking for two new interns, and they just came to me, right? You can thank God about how your deacons and I are working right now on plans to help us better deploy you all to live according to the calling that God's given us to grow deeper, wider, together, and higher. And I'm just scratching the surface. Really, we're not a perfect church. 
I'm not a perfect pastor. You are not a perfect congregation because there are no such things as these things. But man, God is blessing. We have a lot to be thankful for. Would you join me in praying for Cedar Rock? Would you join me in giving thanks for what God is doing in our midst? That's a prayer of thanksgiving. That's the first thing we see here in this prayer. The second thing he prays is a prayer for spiritual sight. So just to make it make sense, I'm going to start again at verse 16 uh, and then, or 15 and then work our way down to get the sense of what he's saying here. Here we go. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. Here we go. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom revelation and the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened. So Paul has given thanks for the church at Ephesus. Now he's saying he's praying for them. Specifically, he's praying that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give them the spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of him. He's praying that the God would give them, the Holy Spirit would give them this supernatural sense of wisdom. He's praying the Holy Spirit would give them revelation in the knowledge of Him. Now, that's a little tricky to, to track with because when you hear revelation, you're probably thinking of that last book in the Bible, right? You're thinking of prophecy. And so maybe you're thinking that God's saying, or Paul's praying that they would have this kind of prophetic abilities or something like that. But that's not what he's saying here. The word revelation literally means like an unveiling or a revealing. And so he wants them, he's praying that the Spirit would unveil or reveal the kind of knowledge, he says, that comes in the knowledge of him or by knowing God himself. He wants them to understand the kind of understanding that can only know, come from knowing God. And then he clarifies for us. He says, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened. Now, I am no doctor. I do not think our hearts have eyes, though. Is that right? Any of you nurse, nurses in the room? Ms. Martha does no. Okay, hearts don't have eyes. What's he saying? He's saying uh, the heart, the inner self, the mind, the will, everything, all this combined together, he wants the inner self to be illuminated, to be able to see the things that he's about to explain. And I, this is, it reminds me of the classic song, Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. And that's the prayer that essentially Paul is praying for this church. This is what Paul is praying. He's praying that God would personally open the eyes of their hearts so they can have wisdom, so they can have the knowledge that can only come from knowing God, so that they will be able to see, as we'll see in a minute, the things that they already have in Christ. Now, what Paul is expressing here in this prayer is really, really important. Because just to kind of tease it out a little bit, there are some things we can know about God right here, right? But there are other things that we can only know about God right here. To put it another way, it's one thing to know facts about God. It's another thing entirely to know God personally, or to be known by God personally. Let me give you an example. For example, imagine if after church we go to Johnny Bulls, right? We're getting the big hamburger there, Johnny Bulls, and, um, and uh, I see a, a friend across the room, and I know this friend's not a Christian, and so I walk over to this friend, and, and I say, hey, um, what is grace? Now, this friend may be able to, to get his phone out and Google uh, what is grace, and Google would give a definition of what grace means and would be able to say it to that degree, right? They could give a suitable definition for what grace is and leave it at that. But what if on the other side of the room, I saw another friend, and this friend, I knew this guy's story. This person had had a rough life. This person had walked away from the Lord, but this person had heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, had turned from his sins and believed in Jesus. God got a hold of his life. He'd been radically changed. He's living for the Lord. And I went over to that person and I said, hey, what do you think grace is? 
You think his answer is going to be the same as what the non-believers is? What do you think? Yes or no? Probably not. Because that guy has a totally different kind of knowledge. He has experienced this grace from knowing God. It's like the difference between knowing the ingredients of Gene Braswell's banana pudding, which is very good, by the way, and tasting it yourself, right? It's one thing to know this is what's in it. It's another thing to take a spoonful and put it in your mouth, a totally different kind of knowledge. That's what Paul's praying. Father, grant them your wisdom. Father, grant them this unveiling that comes from knowing you. Father, open the eyes of their hearts. Not just to know here, but to experience right here. Before we go any further, let me just ask you a question. Have you tasted the banana pudding? (laughs) Not literally. Not literally, although it's good. Have you tasted the goodness of God for yourself? Have you experienced the grace of God for yourself? If you've been coming here any amount of time, I I hope that you have heard the gospel here. And every week I share at some point, and your Sunday school share at some point, the good news of Jesus, that God created us good, we rebelled and fell short of the glory of God, that because of that we deserve God's wrath and judgment for our sins, but God saw our plight and he sent Jesus Christ to come be the substitute for us to bear God's wrath so that when we turn from our sins and place our faith in him, we don't have to have God's wrath. We get God's peace and fulfillment and redemption and forgiveness and wholeness and the future in God's presence, right? This is the gospel message and maybe you've heard it up here, but it's one thing to know the facts, another thing to experience it for yourself. Have you experienced that for yourself? Or maybe, maybe God this morning is opening the eyes of your heart for you at this moment. Maybe today is your day to taste the banana pudding. Repent and believe in the good news of Jesus. And I don't know what the Lord's doing in your life, but if if this is something the Lord is calling you to today, after the service, come find me. Come find a friend. We'd love to talk through how you can give your life to Jesus. So we have a prayer of thanksgiving. We have a prayer of spiritual insight. And all of this leads to the prayer, thirdly, for hope, riches, and power. Now, this could be wildly misunderstood if I left it just there. So let's tease this. Let's see what what the Lord says. A prayer for hope, riches, and power. Verse 18. What it says. Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know, here we go, what is the hope to which he has called you? What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might? The church at Ephesus was filled with people for whom God had opened the eyes of their hearts. Paul is thankful for them. He's prayed that God would open their eyes anew. Why? So they would know these three things. Paul prays, number one, that they would know hope. He says, what is the hope to which he has called you? And if we were thinking spatially, this is where he's saying, church, look back. Look back at the hope to which God has called you. The truth is, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, God has called you. Sometimes we use the language of calling just for people like me, but God's called every believer in Jesus Christ to follow him, right? God's called his people to salvation. And when he calls people to salvation, he grants them hope. Hope for now and hope for eternity. Here's how the Apostle Peter describes it in 1 Peter 1. Verse 3, he says, God has caused us to be born again, a calling, right? To a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And this kind of hope is not based on anything we do or anything we are able to do. Another example, let me just, you know, I know this is kind of far-fetched, but imagine that it were cold enough to snow outside. You know, I know we haven't seen that in a long time, and we're beginning to doubt that it exists But imagine it were cold enough to snow, and it snowed, and and the pond in front of the parsonage is iced over. Sometimes it does that, right? 
the pond in front of the parsonage is iced over. And you, you walk out of church and you think, man, I, I think I want to go step on that pond. And so you walk down to the retention pond over there in front of the, uh, in front of the parsonage, and you could say, you know what? I hope that the ice on this pond is strong enough for me to walk on. You could hope all you wanted to, right? Now, imagine you got a friend in Alaska, and your friend in Alaska lives in front of a big lake. And you call your friend up and you say, hey, look, I'm in front of this pond, and I'm about to walk on it. And your friend says, well, cool, I'm in front of this giant lake in Alaska, and it's been frozen for about a month, and I'm, I'll walk on my lake while you walk on your pond, right? And, and this person could say, I hope that the ice on this lake is strong enough for me to walk on. So you step out in this hope onto the pond. This person steps out on hope on the ice on the lake, and you think you're going to be able to stay on that pond. What do you think? The odds are very small. You'll probably fall in into the water and be a miserable cold mess while your friend in Alaska can walk right on the ice and do ice skating, all this kind of stuff. Thinking, what's the point in all this? Here's the point. What is the difference? You both had hope. You hoped that that ice would hold you. Your friend hoped that the Alaskan ice would hold you. What is the difference? It's not you. It's the object of the hope, right? One object, the ice on the pond, small and feeble, never going to be strong enough for you to walk on. The other object, the lake ice, was sturdy and strong. All this to say, hope, like faith, is only as strong as the object. Christian hope is built on the rock-solid promises of God. I can think of no sturdier object than the rock-solid promises of God. So Paul prays that they would look back and remember this hope that God has called them to, this hope to remember and seize and believe the things that God has promised to his people. I'll just pause here for a second. Maybe this morning you come here and you are tired. You're weary. You're frazzled. Grieving. You're unsure of what tomorrow holds. Maybe you need the same reminder that they had. Look back. God's called you. and He has given you this hope and it's built on his rock-solid promises. Remember this hope. So Paul prays that they would know hope. Secondly, Paul prays that they would know riches. This is what it says. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? Now, Do not misunderstand what I'm saying. Hear me clearly. God is not saying, Paul is not saying that you will get riches from following Jesus. You got that clear? Okay. That is a a point of clarification that needs to be said, right? It's not saying that, great, God's going to give me riches, so let's go put a down payment on the beach property now, uh, since this is what the Bible says. That's not what it says, okay? This is what it's saying. Uh, Last week, we saw in Scripture, in Ephesians, that... um, Paul said that God has made us his inheritance. Remember that. And one day, this is what we read here, that God is going to come back and pick up his inheritance. The riches that he's talking about here is not riches that God gives us now. The riches he's talking about is the fact that God is going to claim us as his riches for all eternity to come. And all this is a reminder that for those who have trusted in Christ, been saved in Christ When you look forward, one day God is coming to claim you. One day God is coming to gather his church, to redeem his church. He will pick up his glorious inheritance, the riches of his church. The riches that we're talking about here are not a paycheck. It's an eternity in God's loving presence as his redeemed people. And Paul prays, church, look forward to that day. Look forward to the day, because looking forward really does change everything. You say, how does that change everything? Let me give you a small example, and I think it'll apply largely. Um, Anybody ever have a hard day? Anybody ever have a hard day? Half of you were telling the truth, half of you were lying, right? Um, Any of you ever have a hard week, hard month, hard year? We've all got them, right? And... When we go through those hard days, hard weeks, hard months, etc., it's really easy to look down right here in front of us and say, there's no hope. I don't see how this problem is going to get any better. But then there's these little things that we get to look forward to. 
And again, this is, this is a small example, but for example, our family has this thing called Family Friday. Every Friday, we cook spaghetti and brownies and watch a movie. Only mild bit of arguing over what the movie will be. You know, my children are saints. They would never argue over such a thing at all. Never. We have Family Friday. And so for me, and this is a small thing, but sometimes when it's a hard day or a hard week, I'm thinking, you know what, if I can just get through here, we got Family Friday coming, and I'll get to be with them and enjoy that time with them. Right? It makes the, the hardness of the day get a little easier because i got something to look forward to. See, see what I'm saying there? You've got your own examples of this. The same is true more broadly in our life. Sometimes life is hard. Sometimes suffering is real and grief is there. But we know and we can look forward Something way better than Family Friday is coming. Jesus is coming to claim his church for all eternity in his loving presence. That sounds pretty good. And so we can endure the challenges of now because one day God is going to claim his inheritance. So Paul prays they know that kind of riches. Third, Paul prays that they would know power. He says, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe? We pray they look back at their calling, look forward at God coming to claim his inheritance, and now we pray that they would look to the present. They would see the immeasurable greatness of God's power for his people. You say, well, what is an example of God's power towards his people? Well, he gives us an example of God's power in these next verses. Pretty long. I'm just going to read it here for you. Verse 19, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the workings of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead, seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Now, candidly, we're not going to be able to do this whole stretch of verses justice. And so actually, I'm going to come back next week and do a deep dive into what he's saying in these verses. But here's the thrust of what Paul is saying in the midst of his prayer. He says, church, do you see what God did for Christ? Do you see... God raised the Son from the dead? Do you see how the Father set the Son at His right hand and and gave Him power to rule and submitted everything to Christ and made Him the head of the church and filled all in all through Christ? Do you see that? He's saying this same God with the same power is at work towards us who believe. Paul prays, he says, I pray that you, church at Ephesus, and by extension, you, church at Cedar Rock, would experience that kind of power for yourself. Uh, You know, um, and it's just amazing what God has done through Christ. Again, one more example of this. Back at Christmas, any of y'all have lights uh, on your house for Christmas? Okay, we had had lights in our house. Probably drove by and saw it. We had a bunch of lights in the front of the house, lights on the tree, lights on the mantel, we had the Christmas village. We had lights in the kids' room. Um, and then, uh, God bless our family, have, have purchased us many inflatables. I, I have not purchased a single inflatable, but they keep showing up every Christmas. And so we had, uh, you know, a Santa on a tractor and a gingerbread man and a this and, and a, um, a giant seven-foot inflatable bulldog, right? All those there in the front yard. Now, you tell me. That's a lot of power that takes up. (laughs) Believe me, I know. I saw my power bill. How did all of those inflatables inflate? How how does it work? You tell me. The power, right? Duke Energy Power Company. Give me the bill for it. But they, Duke Energy Power powers this thing. Now, if they can do all that for my house and every other house down the road, if I were to go buy a brand new little teeny tiny lamp, one little very tiny bulb, plug it into the wall. How do I know it's going to work? Because that same power that powered this Christmas extravaganza can power this one little light bulb, right? The same is true here. If God's power did all this amazing stuff in Christ, think about what he can do in his church. Church, we have access to that 
God is not feeble. God is not twiddling his thumbs. God is not weak or scared. He is powerful. Almighty God is incredibly powerful to do all of these things in Christ. And that same power that he worked in Christ is at work in us. And Paul prays, church, see it. Would you see what God can do? God can do a work. He can grow us in godliness. He can break chains and heal wounds because he is that powerful. These verses, Paul's giving us a prayer, an example, a prayer as he's praying for the church at Ephesus, and he's thanking God for that church. I think we can thank God for each other as well. He's praying that God would open the eyes of their hearts. We can pray that God would open the eyes of our hearts as well. And he's praying that they'd look back to the hope that they had, look forward to the glorious inheritance to come, and look right now to the power that is at work in God's people. May we be as stunned and encouraged by the power that with which he is at work in us. Would you go with the Lord in prayer this morning? Father, help us to learn from Paul's prayer for this church. Pray, God, that you would help us to look back and remember our calling and remember that you've given us hope. Look forward and remember your coming. And remember that you're coming to claim your church. And look at the present with all of its trials and sufferings and fears and anxieties and know that you are at work right here, right now, with the same power that you worked in Christ. God, we thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. To conclude our time this morning, we want to sing holy, holy, holy. And as we sing this song, don't just sing words. Sing it as a prayer to the Lord for who he is and what he has done. Let's stand. Holy, holy, holy. Him too.
Amen. Thank you all for being here today. I'm going to go ahead and invite Miss Judy to come on up so she can be ready and not have to fight through the crowd. You want to go ahead and do that, Miss Judy? Go ahead and come on up and be, and be at the front so y'all can come by and, and uh, reserve what you're going to bring uh, for the, the Griffin family tomorrow. Um, also, just a reminder, if you're interested in helping with the ladies' tea, that'll be on your way. You can go down the basement, and Miss Millie will be down there for that. And then youth parents, talk to Zach and get your kids signed up for, um, for D now. Let's conclude with a word from Romans chapter 6. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And all God's people said, Amen. Go with God this week.